So we're really happy that Richard could be joining us today. So Richard is an Australian born US based engineer, entrepreneur and environmentalist best known for his work in global pollution remediation. So he founded Pure Earth in 1999 using profits from a sustainability consultancy that he started, which is very impressive. And in 2012, Richard convened the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution to scale up the global response to toxic pollution. In 2017, Richard co-chaired the groundbreaking Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, which brought together a group of 50 top researchers around the world to produce a report which outlined the enormous health and economic costs of pollutions, as well as presenting recommendations on ways forward. So we're extremely happy to welcome Richard to the school today to give a global health webinar for the autumn. And his talk today will be focused on reducing exposures to lead globally. And during Richard's presentation, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask him about his presentation or his work at Pure Earth, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll get to those after Richard is finished presenting. So Richard, thanks so much again for joining us and the floor is yours. It's a pleasure, Nina. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's good to be here when Nina called me and asked me to do this. She asked me first to give a briefing on you know, an issue of scale and import and certainly lead fits that category. But she also asked me to talk about how you get to the stage of being able to do something about these sorts of things. I'm happy to give my experience of 30 years of work to, uh, to get to the point where we feel like we can actually make an impact at a global level with this particular issue. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is to um, show you a PowerPoint uh, on the lead issue. Is that working well there, everyone? And Looks go through, great. Excellent, thanks. So we'll go through this for about 20 or 25 minutes. <clears throat> and uh, at the end, I'm happy to take all your questions and talk through you know, what sort of issues you see coming forward and from your perspective. So let me uh, see if I can get this to work. Um, and let me first begin by introducing what, what I wanna go through here. I'd like first to talk about the scope of the issue for lead exposure and why I've actually chosen that Pure Earth and the Global Alliance focus on this particular issue and go through why lead has become such a problem in low and middle income countries and then talk about the strategies and solutions around it. But to give you an introduction first to Pure Earth, it's a nonprofit that I, started in, two, in 1999, specifically around the toxics issues. And when um, I had uh, gotten a bit of headway in, in creating some stability financially with a company that I started called Great Forest, I really wanted to go back and do something that was contributive rather than just play more golf. And um, spent quite a bit of time talking with friends who are in the UN and World Bank and others what were the gaps, what was missing when you were looking at um, global issues related to the environment? And my work had always been focused on environmental issues. But what we looked at was what was happening in climate change, with oceans, biodiversity, um, and the like. And pollution was, was one of the main issues that we looked at. And it was pollution that was the gap, but pollution specifically in low and middle income countries whereas it was pretty well managed with regulatory responses and, and, uh, and a lot of agitation and NGO work in the West, in the global South, it was pretty obvious that it was very much underserved. And so Pure Earth was born out of that particular need. And for the first 10 years or so, we worked on creating a database of acute toxic soil-based pollutions mostly and airborne as well but things that were acutely toxic because one of the big gaps we could see was that there are a lot of people dying unnecessarily from exposure to air, water and soil pollution, especially in the chemicals agenda. And so we started thinking that if we could just try and identify these places, these kind of equivalent to Superfund sites around the world and governments would naturally step in and want to do something about it. 
turns out that's not, that's not the case. That's not how governments work. They need a lot more handholding in most of these countries. And so our work has progressed. In addition to that, it's not just that pointing out the majority of sites that's important. It's focusing on one particular set that seems to bring the most uh, uh, most response from governments as one as one moves forward in these agendas. Let's see if I can get a little more light here. Um, so, um, in terms of the lead issue, that first set of work we did was looking at contaminated sites. These are all places that are as bad as Love Canal and, and many, many times worse in many cases. Over the years, we've looked at 5,000 sites uh, through all of these countries. Now, where you don't see dots, it doesn't mean there isn't uh, problems. It simply means that we haven't had funding to go in and do work in those countries. And in fact, we don't even pretend to be um, uh, all inclusive when we look at one particular country. We just go out and find sites until our budgets are, are depleted. Uh, but this database you can find online um, at toxicsites.org, I think, or contaminatedsites.org. And uh, there's a like a phase one equivalent uh, US EPA that's done on each of these sites. It's used, this data set is used by uh, about 20, 22 countries right now as their key database on, on chemicals exposures and the World Bank makes great use of it and so on. So it's been a very good and successful program. What's interesting about this um, is, and by the way, the, the protocol for developing that was, came originally out of Johns Hopkins School of Public Health uh, with a bit of help from the guys at Harvard and I think there was some Drexel folk on our advisory committees at different times along the way in, in developing this as well. So it's been very academically based uh, in any case. A lot of papers written around it, a lot of this work as well. Um, what was really interesting reviewing this over the last few years was to find that uh, really the majority of issues out there in terms of substance were around lead. Certainly there are issues with arsenic and cadmium and so on like that, but in terms of gross net exposures and numbers of people, it really, lead really was the issue. And if we drill down, for example, here's 294 lead sites on the left in Bangladesh. Um, and we drill down how we actually go about identifying these sites, you know, means going out with an XRF and measuring lead levels in that particular location. So it's a pretty detailed kind of assessment that we can then overlay a population statistic and tell you how many people are impacted and what's the likely um, DALI implications just for that specific site. That's nice because then when you're looking at the cost benefit of doing some work in that site, you can look at the cost per DALI mitigated um, in, a, in a pretty effective way. And we've done that with a lot of the cleanup work that we've done over time. But when we step back and say, look, lead is the, really the biggest issue that we're, we're seeing. And most of it, by the way, I'll, I'll show you later, is around battery recycling, which is done very badly in most low and middle income countries. But we step back, and then, and then we worked with our partners at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation to work out how big is the problem globally? If lead is a big issue that we're seeing in the field, how big is it globally? And we were able to go back and do a few data sets that are, that are available to look at how many people are actually exposed to lead and how many kids are actually above five micrograms, which until the day before yesterday was the US CDC level of action. You may have followed that that now is reduced to 3.5, but at five micrograms per deciliter of blood, we came up with an extraordinary result, which was that um, 800 million children, oh, where is that statistic? Bit slow, this computer. 800 million children are actually exposed to lead. Uh, one in three children in the world have blood lead levels exceeding five micrograms per deciliter. So one in three children, that's an, an, an incredible number. And here is the, um, um, the, the, the map of where those kids mostly are. In fact, a third of them are in India, where we find over 270 million children have blood lead levels above five and 65 million have blood lead levels above 10. You know, just extraordinary kind of numbers. And when we look at the data sets from IHME temporarily, um, we can see that it's getting worse in middle income countries. So India and China are both rising, whereas in US and the West, the numbers are decreasing. This is actually death rates um, per 100,000 from lead exposure. As you may know, lead has quite a strong cardiovascular association. It's responsible right now for around a million premature deaths a year alone. 
Um, but you can see now, everyone's phased out lead in gasoline. India was done in 2000 and China around the same. Um, we did it in the US in 1996, finally, when it was all completed. But it's only in the West that that has ended up in showing you know, substantial long-term decreases in uh, exposure rates and then of course in mortality. Uh, in fact, globally, lead overall is increasing in its global death rate per 100,000. And that's you know, partially attributable to the fact that population, uh, populations are, are aging and the death rate's a function of, 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 of uh, populations aging, but it's mostly because there is in fact um, newer exposures out there that haven't been addressed, even after gasoline has been sorted out and lead in paint has been sorted out, there are other exposures that are problematic. And let me go through um, those with you. But again, a lot of this data can be found in a report that we put out last year with UNICEF called The Toxic Truth, um, which uh, uh, really goes into great amount of detail in showing how many kids are actually exposed and what the implications are for them. So I, I highly recommend that that report to you. So let me go, before I go and start to talk about where the sources and these new sources of lead are that we're really not, we really haven't understood well, and the fact that most of them are low and middle income countries is representative of that. Let me also go in and show you some of the new data around the impact that lead has in children. And if you're a lead specialist, you'll know some of this already. Nevertheless, the first thing is you have to know that this causes brain damage. It, in, in animal studies, uh, the number of connections per neuron in the frontal cortex is, is substantially reduced by as much as 20%, and brain volumes are down 2 and 3% when there are exposures of lead uh, equivalent to 5 or 10 micrograms per deciliter. We know, of course, from human studies that there's a loss of intelligence with 3 to 5 IQ points um, being set up and, and substantial increases in disability and learning disorders from this. I think this... This is one of the key drivers that really makes this, this particular issue so compelling within the panoply of all the different chemicals issues that are out there. This particular toxin, first of all, it's everywhere. One in three people in the world have this and it causes permanent brain damage. And when you go to a politician and say, what's happening right now in your country is a third of all your children, babies are brain damaged. You really can get attention from them. It really does does make uh, make impact to them, and the implications um, are especially true for maternal maternal uh, issues. There's a, a flush of lead from mother's bones that goes into the blood as as babies are developing in utero, where you see an increase in blood lead levels that um, uh, is shows up also in the infant blood lead levels when they're born. It's also in breast milk as well. So mothers who have, who have lead in their bones who are expressing or are exposed to lead in their day-to-day -day activities, which I'll show you, often may mean just eating the wrong foods. Um, they will be poisoning their children. So um, it's, a, it's an issue that, that we need to be addressing by, by measuring kids and pregnant women is the main issue there. But in terms of impact, I wonder if, some of you have already seen these two curves on the right, because what, what you can do is you can say, look, one kid has lost three to five IQ points. What's the big deal? It happens. But when you look at that at a, at a national scale, this top curve is uh, 100 million people with an average IQ um, at 100. That's the definition of IQ, I guess. And that means that six million of them are gifted and will have... Um, IQs above 130 and are capable of, you know, getting PhDs and doing all the sort of things that you guys are doing. And as an equivalent 6 million need services. They're in the disabled category. But if you shift that entire curve to the left, the number of capable entrepreneurs, developers, PhD candidates and the rest of them reduces by more than half. And the number of people who need services, who need to be paid and spent for by the government increases by about 57%. So that, that's happening right now. This exact problem is happening right now in literally 100 countries right now. This is happening where, where we're dumbing down the population and we're destroying the capacity of those governments 
to uh, of, of those countries to be able to develop effectively. Um, and this is a lot of the reason why development doesn't go as quick as people think it should do in a lot of African countries. It's, uh, it's functional around how bad the lead exposures are in those countries. Uh, the World Bank puts a dollar amount to this. They look at the difference in lifetime earnings per IQ point. And there's a correlation there where in the US, I think it's around $30,000 per IQ point that someone will earn over their lifetimes. So if you take each cohort of kids who were born, look at the number of them who will have lead um, exposures that will cause uh, reductions in IQ and add up all those IQ losses for that particular year and look at their lifetime lost earnings as a result of that, the numbers become astronomical very quickly. It's over a trillion dollars in GDP loss globally, but it's 4% of GDP in Africa. So if you've got a country that's struggling to move forward and grow and you're taking 4% off the top because of the chemical exposure, uh, that's kind of it's kind of telling. It's more than that as well. There's also um, uh, pretty solid evidence and some papers underway right now that look at the relationship between lack of self-control and therefore more violent behavior in people who've had lead exposure in utero. And these curves are, are quite famous. Um, the red curve is, uh, sorry, the black curve is blood lead levels going up and down as lead was pushed into gasoline and then taken out. The red curve is violent crime rates, but 18 years uh, later. And the, the relationship between these two implies that uh, kids who are brain damaged show less capacity for self-control, for, for empathy, um, for being able to modulate their, you know, their impulses because of that damage to the frontal cortex. And that is what's responsible for these increases in crime rates. There's a lot more to this that's underway in study right now at USC and Oxford that uh, uh, will show a lot more that'll come out sometime in the next uh, year or so that I'm very excited to see because I think when you add this to the intellectual cost and the, the economic evaluation of this, lead becomes just an extraordinarily impactful problem out there that really makes it worth addressing. Um, it puts it in the international sphere up amongst those things like uh, uh, ozone depletion or malaria, it certainly kills more people than malaria, or, or dare I say, perhaps even something, you know, towards what climate change is doing uh, globally. It does have that sort of multi-causal responsibility, you know, because we look at IQ loss, educational attainment, increases in violence, these are the quantifiable uh, symptoms of brain damage. But, um, come on. It's, a, it's the cross-cutting nature of this that really, I think, makes this so compelling. And the, and the destruction of, of social potential that occurs as a result of these, these sorts of exposures. So let me get to the next step because now we see a problem that's enormous. It's affecting a third of all the children, which means it's affecting a third of all of the people in the world. In some countries, it's half of all the people in the world are lead poisoned at this level. But where and how and why? Because it's not gasoline, and it's not it's not paint anymore as well. This is the main reasons why we're getting lead exposure, and I'll go through them. But there are different um, exposure uh, profiles in different countries. So in Georgia, it's mostly spices, but in India, it's mostly lead acid batteries. So let me go through each of these in, in a little bit more detail and show you some more. Lead acid battery is about car recycling. Every car, even your EV, has a lead acid 12 volt battery. And those um, batteries in the West would be recycled in a facility that would cost $100 million, has negative air pressure, there are no releases to the environment, very carefully regulated. And they recycle 99 plus percent of the battery into a new battery. They're a beautiful example of a circular economy. That doesn't happen in the West. And I'll show you a video on, of how they do it in, I'm sorry, in, in the global South. That doesn't happen in the global South. And I'll show you a video in a second. The other insane problem out there is we see a lot of people adding lead chromate or other lead salts, which are beautiful, bright colors. They're adding it to spices, especially turmeric. A turmeric, bright yellow. If you see this in a marketplace, it's not likely to show up 
in Whole Foods or shop and stop, but it may show up in an artisanal marketplace where it's being imported from a country that where this is happening. If you see it this bright color, tell everyone not to buy it. It's going to be heavily contaminated with, with lead, lead salts of sort. In, in uh, Georgia, this is responsible for 85% of all lead exposures, the country of Georgia. In Bangladesh, where we've also studied, it's responsible for almost 60% of lead exposures. In the northern parts of India, it's around 40% of lead exposure. So it varies from country to country, depending on the source analysis. The last one to show you here is the glazing on these lovely earthenware pots. And these, these, this beautiful artisanal activity goes on in many, many countries where they use lead as the basis for the glaze. And it's a very good glaze for low temperature backyard kind of operations where you've probably got a wood fired kiln. Uh, and the, the glaze it makes is strong and durable, but when you put uh, heat and food in or any kind of uh, low level acid like lime juice, the lead leaches into the food and then you, uh, and then it becomes bioavailable. The, Cookware is responsible for 80% of Mexico's exposure um, and other countries varyingly. So these three, there are a few others. There is some lead in paint in low and middle income countries, but very little. It mostly was a Western problem in the US and somewhat in the UK, but pretty much no, not showing up most else. There's some cosmetics in India where they'll put uh, lead based um, products on their on their eyes and, the, and the, the dot in the middle of the head, those sort of things, and a few other exposures like this. But those three, we think are responsible for about 80, 85% of all lead exposures globally. Just to talk about paint, because there's been a lot of attention to lead in paint. If you go in and look in the literature, um, lead paint does not show up as a major exposure source. This particular study, I also recommend to you by Ericsson, a former pure author, um, and really looked in detail at what were the likely to be the key exposures um, while, uh, while by looking at the, at the research data. So let me talk about battery recycling, which is because batteries are 85% of all lead that's consumed globally. It's really interesting to understand what's going on there because it is, if not the immediate direct exposure for a lot of these people, it's certainly creating the feedstock that goes into the turmeric or the, or the glazing or, or other sorts of exposure. And let me see whether I can show you this video rather rapidly. Um, Can you see this uh, pure earth screen right now? No, it's it's blank at the moment. It's black. You're, we're sharing, we're seeing your screen, but it's black. We'll try mm -hmm. again. Yes. Let me try this. Is that better? Now can you see? Yep, the... looks great. Now we can see the YouTube. Perfect. Okay. okay. So let me just play the first two minutes of this uh, so you can understand the issue. The process looks like this typically. It's done in a backyard. They'll take a battery, they'll take an axe to it, they'll chop the top, um, kind of rip open the top of the battery, they'll dump out the acid, typically just on the dirt, and then they'll remove the plates and um, essentially remelt them down in an open furnace. And the process um, releases lead dust. Um, and lead dust is particularly dangerous to children and it's particularly dangerous when it's done in residential communities where kids are playing all day, where uh, pregnant mothers are. It is the number one pollution source that we identify in the world. The informal recycling of these takes place in every city, in every low and middle income country, uh, with very few exceptions. If you and I saw these batteries, we would call them all car batteries. Um, in fact, they do not all go in cars. Anytime that there is a cell tower, at the base of that tower is a stack of, you know, 10 or 50 of these batteries. And then in a lot of 
countries that experience power outages, every family will have a small stack of these batteries as just simply backup power. Um, and the reason that this informal recycling is so prevalent in so many communities is because lead is quite valuable now. And the process of removing the lead from these batteries and melting it back into bars to sell to battery manufacturers is not one that requires any particular education or training. If you're doing this out of subsistence, if this is your only choice for feeding your family, and you're not aware of the risks that you're creating, then it makes sense you know, from an individual standpoint to do this. All it takes is a little bit of knowledge about batteries and what's inside them and the health effects of lead and then you know, your daily life of seeing this process to put two and two together and say, there's a problem here. So um, the rest of it, you, you can see, just shows how you can clean up these sites and do it very cost effectively and make, make quite an impact. Um, but let me go back to um, the PowerPoint, if I'm clever enough to do that appropriately. <clears throat> Are we back to the PowerPoint? Yep, we can see it looks great. Amazing, that's terrific. So this is a major exposure um, problem in low and middle income countries. We figure there's 100 or 100 to 200,000 sites that are either being contaminated by this activity because they might have been shut down and shooed away and they end up opening up again uh, just down the road. Um, or, or um, and so they all need to be regulated and controlled in a way where, where they can, can be dealt with. And the basis behind this informal structure is for those of you who are economists is that it's basically a market failure because the, the informal guys can buy the batteries um, for a higher price than the formal uh, high investment uh, facilities that are out there and there needs to be government interventions in the economic policies that are there to drive the scrap batteries to the formal sector and not to the informal sector and this is a very fertile area to study and come up with strategies and solutions. And we've seen some successes, very early successes with getting rid of the, uh, um, uh, the GST, the sales tax on scrap batteries, which the informal guys don't pay in the first place, to putting in place a small deposit, say an additional $15 that goes back to a formal recycler when they recycle a battery adequately so that they can buy the scrap at a price that's above uh, the informal sector. So these are the sort of things that, that we think are necessary to, to make a change here, aside from obvious reason of the, you need to have the regulate, regulatory response and enforcement to hold these operations. But that is not sufficient though, to be able to fix this issue um, at, at, uh, at scale. Turmeric. Oddly enough, is an easier fix than the battery issue because usually it's just half a dozen people who are adding lead chromate at a particular point while they're grinding up the turmeric. They're adding it because it wasn't the highest quality turmeric and it looks a little brown. So let's make it nice and orange. Finding those people, putting a couple of them in jail, doing some public education in the marketplaces to everyone. It's, it's worked. We've had this be successful in, in Bangladesh where our marketplace studies found 90% of turmeric was contaminated, then an intervention collaborating with the government. And afterwards, uh, only 2% of turmeric samples were contaminated. So clearly we need to keep our foot on the pedal in continuing to do that and replicate that in other places. But the solution to the turmeric is not terribly complicated. Because everyone eats turmeric three times a day in many of these countries. You think of the entire um, uh, uh, latitudes around the equator are heavy spice users, and turmeric's one of the big ones. Um, because of that, this can have an enormous benefit to society in just managing this particular intervention.
So let me just talk a little bit more about what we see um, are issues and where there are gaps, because I'm also cognizant that uh, what uh, we'd like to do here is to you know, encourage you all to be involved in this issue and perhaps to take it up. We need more, more players in this particular game. It's not um, currently a, as well served as it ought to be. If we ran a conference now and brought every person dealing with lead into a conference, we would not have more than a few hundred people in it. Whereas malaria, which has, um, uh, has only half the number of people dying per year from it, would have perhaps uh, two or 300,000 people that would come to a conference. So this is an area that is pregnant and ready for development. Big areas where things need to be done. Basic data collection, very, very little, very few countries in the global south are doing proper testing. And similarly from that testing, going out and analyzing which are the key sources and need to be worked on it. And similarly in finding which of those key sources, doing the analysis to work out what kind of interventions are gonna be effective. That's also a big uh, miss. And for those of you who are policy-based or communications-based, there's an enormous amount of work that needs to happen in those processes as well. We've started a, a new initiative with uh, UNICEF and the Clarios Foundation called Protecting Every Child's Potential. And this, this has provided a good amount of seed funding to go and work and do this sort of work in six countries. It's enough to get started, but there's a lot more, you know, we're always looking for more resources to do this work. By the way, the Clarios Foundation is uh, funded by its parent, uh, the company is called Clarios, and they're the largest battery manufacturer and recycler in the world. They're responsible for about one third of all car batteries. Now they run state-of-the-art, high-tech, very clean facilities wherever they're in, in operation. So they're one of the big formal sector guys, but they are deeply concerned. They want to be on the side of angels and they're deeply concerned about what's going on at the bottom of the chain there and really committed to doing something about it. So they're actually good guys. And again, um, this partnership is, uh, if you have associations with, uh, uh, you know, specifically around universities or NGOs or the rest of it, this is open for membership. And there are new, there are, there are, there's now four or five new people who've joined it, including uh, Vital Strategies, including the International Lead Association, um, and others are joining it as it moves along as well. And we can talk you know, for a long time about where new programs are needed most urgently to do more work in this area. So I'm just, let me su uh, summarize a little and, and go, go over to your questions. Um, we think this is compelling because of the economic cost, uh, because it impacts kids uh, in a way that causes long-term societal damage. We don't see much opposition to this. When we bring this up in governments and all the rest of it, um, the, uh, the people who need to change their behavior are generally small in number and not particularly vocal. So it's the backyard recycler who may in any one country only number in total employment, 300, 400, 500 people. They're mostly two or three person shops that are doing all this damage. They can clearly be relocated into doing work related to collecting batteries in a safe manner and bringing them to the formal sector. And we've seen that be successful in Brazil where the informal sector is shut down because of government changes and all of that network of people ended up working much better rates, by the way, for the formal sector. So this is solvable and can bring a huge amount of benefit for them. So we're very keen to, to see this work develop and grow as, as time goes on. And so with all of that now in front of you all, let me stop the presentation and I welcome all of your questions. Nina, back to you. Great, thanks Richard for that really fascinating presentation and video. So I'm gonna remind our attendees to feel free to send in any questions that you have on the Q&A function that you have at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I guess I'll start because I have so many questions given all the information that you presented. Um, 
you know, one of the questions that I have, you kind of mentioned to this and alluded to this, but how aware and how involved are the communities in the countries in which you work? You go into a country, you work with specific communities that are impacted by lead poisoning. Do they, are they aware that it's a problem before you go in or is there a lot of public awareness raising that you have to do about the, the health impacts of it, the environmental impacts, et cetera? And the second part of the question is, how engaged are they in both collecting the data and information on lead poisoning, but also in crafting the solutions um, to, to address it? Yeah, and I think you framed it just right because there is kind of two steps in this. The first is creating that awareness within communities. And when we, when we go in and work in a new country or a new region or a new city or even just a new locality, it's a mixed bag. Sometimes there are people there who have been aware of the problem and are screaming blue murder, and we're coming there with our resources because of them. Sometimes we're finding these places and addressing them because of research that we've done independently. And, um, and it requires some education for the local community to kind of realize that's the reason they're having all these troubles. Um, once the the awareness is there though. Uh, we have just most extraordinary response from local communities to provide all kinds of services and support to be involved in the solution, to really move it along. And our modality of working is not to send in people from the West to go in and solve these problems on, our, on their behalf. Our modality is instead to provide resources, both money and technical expertise to local organizations so they can learn how to do this and, and, and take on the solutions themselves. So we're very much about providing those sorts of services into at the community level, sometimes at the federal and national level too, we're involved with these economic kind of processes, but it's always using uh, nationals and, and not uh, the UN consultant kind of model. We don't like that very much at all. So it's, it's very much uh, uh, a process that, uh, that, uh, that works for local communities. I can see a couple of chats here, one from... Yeah, well, they're, they're mostly just lauding and praising your presentation, but you do have a question, which is, um, can you say something more about the challenges of remediation? If all sources of lead were eliminated, what would be the ongoing burden and length of time from environmental lead that hasn't been addressed? Yeah, so um, this is an interesting problem and it's one that we, we don't really have anything except for um, a few expert opinions on at the moment. The data is not really there to be able to say whether it's all soil pollution that you know, needs some time until it re reduces or whether it's other exposures. But I think now, especially after some of the most recent work that we've done, and especially within about six months when we're doing a, a really detailed market assessment, what I think we're gonna find is that the majority of the exposures are actually things that are occurring in the kitchen. They're pots and pans and foods that are contaminated and the like, and things that are being consumed with low levels of lead on a regular basis that are causing these, these high levels. And instead, the site contaminated issues that require remediation, they're quite specific there are a lot of them. They're, they're causing kids to have 40, 50, 60 micrograms, whereas the kitchen is causing kids to have seven, eight, nine micrograms. But the sites are responsible for perhaps 10% of the population exposure at high levels. And the kitchen stuff is responsible for 90% of the population at these mid levels. So we want to attack both of these. You know, both of them have inherent values that that are important. We don't want to see kids go into acute lead exposures. We want you know make sure that we know how to be able to treat and manage them. But that low level where most of the impact from lead occurs, that's where you can make the most impact. So let's say um, to answer your question a little more directly, Joe, if we were to see a country stop and go formal in their recycling operations, and let's say they had a thousand informal sites that need to be cleaned up. Um, it cleaning them up is not that as expensive as you would, you would see as you would normally be concerned about. It, it might cost 
hundreds of millions of dollars to do all of those sites and bury the contaminated soil somewhere safe, but it's not going to cost billions of dollars. So that from a cost perspective, it's very doable. But again, from a, an effectiveness for dealing with this at a population level, it's kind of the third thing to do. Once you've stopped the exposures, dealt with the in the kitchen, then you can go to the remediation side of things. So we're really focusing right now on the the upstream side of this equation and a little less on the remediation at this stage, five years, and then we're planning on getting back more into the remediation side of things. Joe, did that answer, answer it well enough? Muted. Great, so Joe says yes. Um, we're, we've noted in five years, we'll circle back to you to see if uh, the remediation work has started. Um, no, but you know, it's, it's so interesting when you talk about upstream, factors. So one of the areas and interventions that you mentioned for spices, for cookware, obviously for battery recycling is regulation. Um, and um, I'd be curious to hear, you know, is it often, I mean, how much of the interventions is focused on revising or even implementing regulations in some places? I would assume that in some places there are are not necessarily regulations addressing lead in spices and cookware. And oh, that's something that you, they're yeah. Always, they're, always, they're, they're always, sorry? There always are regulations addressing toxins in foodstuffs. That's quite so, a but it's So it's an enforcement issue, it sounds like? Yeah, it's almost always an enforcement issue. You know, updating regulatory standards would be just a little tiny piece if mm. there's some small fill-in, but there's, you know, we haven't been to a country, even the poorest countries that we work in, they already have these standards in place. They just don't have any enforcement capacity. Or if the enforcement is done, there's not, a, not an adequate capacity to follow on to deal with, you know, the, the recycling facility just moving 100 meters down the, the river or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think they can shut them down and then a week later they'll start up again somewhere else. Or the guys doing turmeric, they have to be constantly re-monitored. You can, you can monitor them once, but you have to keep going back and do it again and again and again. So it's that, that capacity where you, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of our work often is providing some, uh, some support where an, an NGO that we're funding, we can't fund governments, of course, but an NGO will end up uh, having some of its people seconded into a government agency to either provide training or actual regulatory enforcement kind of services out into the field. That's, that's, that's some of the stuff that we're, that we're putting into our, into our work plans. That's so fascinating. The other, the other question that I had in watching the video was, I mean, the process of watching this informal recycling process looks harrowing to me as a, you know, if you're a worker in one of those informal it's not even a plan, I guess, a backyard operations. There also must be some severe workers' rights or worker safety issues. Um, is that something that you have encountered in visiting all these informal recycling sites that you've seen across the various countries? Yeah, it's a very toxic job. Um, you know, I, I think if it's a matter of how much you pay you guys. And a lot mm -hmm. of the time, these are small operations that are run by a family. Mm -hmm. So it's them making food to put on the, the table for their own kids, money for food. So um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think um, the worker rights issues have ever come up as being a significant kind of issue in, at this stage. Um, but I could see that happening as time progresses. The, these small operators um, uh, are likely to employ a few friends, uh, the neighbors, that sort of thing. There are though, in some of these industries and especially in the pottery industry, mm -hmm. people who are employing 50 people, 100 people um, and that mid-sized business then I think is more likely to have issues that will re retain, you know, be similar to OSHA in how they're operating. Mm -hmm. But we're yet, we're yet to kind of find out who these guys are and how they're operating and, and find a way in to be able to uh, support them to change their work practices in a way that's effective. That's, that's something that, that's on our, on our platter, but new for us. 
Yeah, so that, that was actually a follow-up question that I had. So you were talking about a situation in Brazil where you were able to move some folks who were engaged in, you know, in the, the informal recycling process to be in the formal sector and they had higher wages and salaries and it seemed like a, sounded like a successful pilot. So in terms of if, if a lot of, if there are people in communities that are engaging in this for subsistence purposes in terms of earning money, are there oftentimes alternative options that the communities or the NGOs who you're working with and collaborating with find to support the families and communities as an alternative to informal recycling? Or is it mostly the interventions moving towards, you know, engaging with the formal sector in terms of recycling? How yeah. do you look at employment? Yeah. There, those are the two options that we, mm. that we, that we consider in it all. Um, the feedback I got from the senior people in India, for example, where this is a major concern, was that um, if the facility was in a large city or town, not to worry about it, there's so many other things that people can do. Um, and, you know, these folk, there's, there's not more than in each town or city, dozen, a dozen of them. It's not like they're, you know, 5,000 people per city. It's a, a small number of people. Um, the the advice we were given was that they'll readily be absorbed into all kinds of other different workflows. But separate to that, we also see the need to, as the formal sector develops and encourages, to make sure that these, these folk can be absorbed into that particular workflow as well, so that they do have, they do have an option. So it's, I, don't, I don't think this is going to be a substantial um, uh, livelihoods issue as we, as we continue to expand it into other countries. Excellent. So the a question that I have also more broadly about this work is you, you were talking about encouraging students and other experts um, uh, to, to be more involved in these issues, to be more engaged in raising awareness around lead poisoning globally and to take action, whether that's research or policy or programmatic action. So I'm wondering from your perspective, if you could highlight, you know, three key points that you wanted the students, the faculty, the staff from this talk to, to take away, what would, your, what would your three key points be in terms of addressing lead poisoning globally? I think- I realize it's putting you on the spot as a fast thinker, right. but yeah. It's difficult to you know, say what the three key issues are, but I think the main, the main concern is to note that this is an up and coming issue of global import that has an enormous footprint that we haven't really recognized in, until very recently. And so therefore, as a, from a career perspective, it's, it's ripe with opportunity, absolutely ripe with, with opportunity. And funders will come into this field, you know, uh, in, in from many, many different sides as, as it becomes more known. The second uh, kind of issue to think about there is that there are a range of different questions that need to be answered from a research perspective or from a policy perspective. And you could choose any particular country or region or you know, particular aspect, is it the social services or is it the actual straightforward monitoring sort of issues that need to be addressed? Any of those will bear fruit for someone who's interested in getting involved. Whether you wanna go out and start your own NGO and get involved, you, know, you talk to us, we'll show you 10 different countries that would love to have this sort of work, uh, go out and do some work. If you wanna go and do your PhD in this area, there's so many opportunities to, to do stuff that will actually move the needle, not just write something that'll get you the letters, but actually create change in the world that you can measure and be proud of. It's just that sort of issue. Excellent, that's so exciting. Well, um, I, I see that we also have one last question, uh, for, also from Joe. Uh, how many people are you hiring? I think we've got, <laughs> um, uh, we've got three, four open slots right now, and we'll have more in the in the new year, but there's there's quite a few slots that are open at the moment. Program managers, um, there's an MEL, monitoring evaluation requirement that we, we need to bring in. We need to be really monitoring all that, that sort of stuff. So that's happening as well. And then we need an HR person. So there's, there's always slots open for us in our work. Yes, well, this is a very exciting area, ripe for growth and excellent intersections between environmental health 
um, as well as um, public health across the board. So we're so pleased to be able to have you with us today, Richard, to give us an overview of the work that you and your colleagues have been doing for many decades in low and middle income countries and highlighting specific issues that the students might not necessarily have learned in their other classes. And so um, we, what we'll do is we'll put the link to obviously Peer Earth with the webinar, but also highlight the other projects that you launched with UNICEF and the Clarios Foundation as well. And um, if you have other questions um, on this issue, you can feel free to reach out to myself and we can put you in touch with the relevant folks in Peer Earth. But we just wanna take the time right now to express our appreciation to Richard and his whole team for putting together this presentation and also incredibly importantly for the work that you've been doing um, with Pure Earth for the last couple of decades in highlighting this important issue of lead poisoning globally. So thank you so much, Richard. And um, yes, we will be sure to keep in touch. That sounds great. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and uh, always happy to, to, uh, to spread the word. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Take care, everyone. Have a nice day.